Life is for the Living and we're excited to have you with us on the show today. My name is Joyce Chooks and this is The Breakfast Show on TSM Nigeria TV. An antique saying goes that there is no place like home. However, the reverse seems to be the case in Nigeria. We have over hundreds of thousands of youths fleeing the country every year in search of greener pastures. This is without doubt but about a low turn in human capital. This morning we are joined and said by immigration experts and with one who has over 18 years of experience working with the civil service sector in person of Mr. Roland Noaha. Good morning, sir. Welcome and thank you for joining us on set this morning. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me begin by satisfying our curiosity. What actually made you toward this line of duty? Well, um, I think um, I would say it was first by accident. Accident? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why accident, sir? Um, my first um, experience um, working was um, with a non-governmental organization. Okay. And um, it was basically um, to promote um, awareness on HIV AIDS. Yeah. And I found myself working especially with young people uh, because of issues of, um, um, you know, um, unprotected sexual um, activity common among young people. True. And um, we started to promote um, a particular brand of condom at the time. Wow. You know. So um, that was the first experience. And okay. I found myself working with, um, you know, young people and after that um someone introduced me to the then first first lady of edo state mrs eki and um, she shared her vision about her organization and then um, i just said this is the place i need to be okay. you know um i have lived in i was born in edo state here and um, i've lived um you know in neighborhoods in you know um areas and i've seen and experienced firsthand the issue of migration, you know, how people um, traveled abroad and suddenly people who were very poor became <laughs> relatively <laughs> rich, you know, as a result of the experience, you know. And, um, you know, getting to know that this was a problem, because at the time I didn't see it as a problem. I saw it because personally also, as soon as I finished secondary school, I wanted to migrate as well because hey. that was whatever you know, Everyone was doing. Was doing at the time, you know. And then I never saw it as a problem until I started to work at the organization, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I said to myself that this is um, something I want to talk about because I have a first-hand experience. Knowledge, working experience. with people. Yeah. Well, well, why, why do you see it as a problem? Because you said initially this as, as a problem. Yeah. So why do you say it's a problem now? You see it as a problem now. Yeah. Um, I discovered that quite a number of people died, you know, in the course of wanting to migrate. Hmm. You know, uh, many families were um, disrupted. Um, people sold properties, um, you know, landed properties to get abroad. All in the big yeah. greener pastures. Exactly. And many of them couldn't achieve this aim. You know, and that left many families homeless. You know, many of the young people died um, in the course of the journey, and that left many of the f their parents also traumatized. You know, as a result, you know, and that was when I felt I have to talk There's about it. Problem. Of that, a lot of people still want to live. Yes, um, as you will know, um, <laughs> the economic situation in the country, as well as the security um, situation, hasn't improved. You know, in the last decade. And um, this is the major reason, you know, why many people still want to live. So there was something that, you know, growing up, I lived in Benin my whole life. I'm still in Benin. There was one thing that I knew about Benin or knew about the place that I lived. Every family or almost every family had somebody abroad. Austria, Germany, Italy. Stress <laughs> Italy. Anything, you, you, I had this neighbor that had so many people abroad, anything she wore, she would say, ah, they send and come. I used to be so jealous. Mm -hmm. And then I, I saw a report that said, as of 2016, mm -hmm. over 20,000 people that were found crossing the Mediterranean Sea were Nigerians. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, there's a lot of countries in West Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that engage in this kind of travel. But Nigerians still take up the bulk of the people. So is this because we have the highest population? Or is it that 
illegal or irregular migration is really big a problem in Nigeria. Yeah, you, you already said it. Uh, mm. One of the major reasons is the huge population okay. of, of the country. And then we have um, a huge number of um, unemployed youths and, of course, socially dislocated um, young people um, who are unable to find opportunities, you know. And um, the easiest means is for them to um, migrate. Um, even since um, um, after independence, uh, many Nigerians have migrated. You know, um, first it was, if you look at the migration pattern, it was first within um, West Africa and then within the African continent. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, in the 80s, many of them started to move to Europe, you know, mm -hmm. and of course to America, to Europe, you know. Um, the period usually described as the brain drain, you know, where many um, Nigerian professionals left as a result of... Um, you know, the harsh economic situation, um, okay. policies. We are not talking um, about those that are unemployed now, we are talking about professionals. Exactly. Yes, professionals are, are really in the country. Country. were the first set of people that left. And then, of course, um, the exchange rates between the Naira and, and other foreign currencies, currencies, you know, started to, you know, increase, you know. And then, um, if, you, if you work in Europe, even if it's a minor job, and you bring back this money back home, it becomes a lot of money. It does. And so that became a major motivation you know, for people to want to move. So I saw a poll carried out on 69 people. A bulk of them were fresh graduates, NYIC, and students in their final year. And they were talking about irregular migration, the people that leave, leave, left illegally, the people that go on um, tourist visas, and then they overstay their visas, and then the people that went to seek asylum, and then they failed. These yeah. three groups of people. Yeah. So the, the group tried to educate these 69 people on these particular people, and all they kept saying was that the end justifies the means. Yeah. So in migration, does the end genuinely justify the means? Unfortunately, um, it is. You know, it justifies the means. Um, we live in a society where, as a professional, as a young university graduate, you cannot find a job. You know. It's difficult. Um, it's difficult to find a job. It's difficult to, to have a good life in Nigeria. You know. so, and you see someone who never went to school, someone who is not a professional, you know, suddenly travels abroad and comes back, builds a house, live comfortably, you know. Mm -hmm. So for everyone, that's, that's what matters mm -hmm. in the end, you know. And that's why we've seen even Nigerian professionals, engineers, doctors, doctors. you know, travel to, um, to Europe, to America, and they end up doing odd jobs, you know. And, I mean, what matters is that they're able to take care of their families back home, okay. you know. So that's why I would say that the end does justify, justify the means. Okay, yeah. maybe we can move this conversation now over to reintegration because that's primarily what you do. Yeah. What is the reintegration? Explain that to us. Um, yes, we have discussed um, Nigerians traveling, mm -hmm. and um, many of them, of course, arrive in these countries and their expectations are not met. Mm. You know, um, um, some of these European countries are also faced with some form of economic problems, you know, and so Nigerians arrive in this country, not only Nigerians, of course, but of course, like we've said, Nigerians are moving in large numbers, and then uh, many of them um, arrive in these countries and are not unable to meet their expectations, and so it becomes a problem for them to, you know, um, reintegrate in such societies, and good enough, um, the new trend you know, because, I mean, the Europeans especially, they, they, they are one of the countries in the world or continents in the world that promotes human rights. Mm. You know, they, they want people to return back in a dignified way, you know, and that's when they started um, to introduce the concept of um, assisted voluntary return and reintegration. Mm -hmm. And this concept is that when you cannot stay in these countries, you are um, allowed to take the option of return, which is voluntary, in quotes. <laughs> you know? And so you go back to your country, and then you have the opportunity to receive some kind of in-kind support. It could be CAC support, you know, to enable you to start a fresh life, you know, a new life, an income generating activity. It could be to find accommodation, depending on what um, you need to start a new life in Nigeria. 
So basically, reintegration is to prepare the person to adjust back to the Nigerian environment, you know, to, to have education, to have health, to have a business, you know, you know tailor-made um, um, activities that can help the person Settling. stay back. Exactly. Okay. Now, we're talking country. about those that traveled already outside Nigeria mm -hmm. and they want to bring them back. What about those that pass through lands to Libya mm -hmm. and they experience a lot of things over there? And they come back. Mm. So what's what's what do they have for them? Do, do they, they fall under this scheme? Fall back, yes. Mm. Fall back to. Unfortunately, um, as a result of the desperation mm. for many young people, especially to want to leave the country, uh, many of them risk their lives. You know, on these dangerous journeys. Um, a major case in point is the um, the Libya situation. You know, many of us saw the CNN documentary on sales of uh, migrants in Libya, you know, and um, that brought about, you know, international attention, you know, to the plight of migrants in Libya. Not only Nigerians were affected, you know, other countries in Africa, you know, some Eritreans, um, Ethiopians, you know, Sierra Leoneans, Ghanaians, they were, but of course Nigeria formed a bulk of this number, you know. So many of them became stranded in Libya. And as you know, um, Libya at the time was also going through um, tumor. You know, um, there was political crisis. Of course, there was a war, you know, in yeah, Libya yeah, at the time, you know. So many of them got caught up in the process. And um, um, to date, the International Organization for Migration, because we work closely with the IOM, um, they have assisted over 17,000 Nigerians wow. um, back from Libya. Mm -hmm. And um, um, there's, of course, there are also reports that about 10,000 more Nigerians are still stranded mm -hmm. in Libya. That's to tell you the numbers, you know. And, um, you know, it, it's an assisted return program. These um, Nigerians were assisted back through chartered flights and on return back to the country, um, they were given temporary accommodation. And um, there was a program, um, of course, it was funded by the EU, um, the EU IOM Joint Initiative. And um, they were trained on business startups. Um, they were provided um, psychosocial counseling and then um, assisted to set up businesses, you know. Okay. So That's fantastic. This, this is um, what the international community um, does for um, these Nigerians going through the land borders. But okay. of course, there are other um, Nigerians stranded in the Gambia, in mm. other I'm African countries spread yeah. across um, the region. But, but Mr. Roland, mm. sir, with all this that the EU is putting into place, I know mm. international bodies are trying to see how they can actually help these people. Mm. I think, or I would like to really know, what you think the problem is, let's, let's come home mm. with Nigerians mm. who actually mm. educate their children and tell them, my daughter, you're of age. Mm -hmm. I want you to travel out. You know, there's this woman who is going to come around. She will take you there to lend. Oh, yeah. She will yeah. actually just help you because through yeah. your profile, I know that you mm -hmm. you have some work you do with that, um, human trafficking as well. Sure, you sure. know, and yeah. a neighbor actually related to me that oh, when she was young, I actually did tell her that there's a woman who's going to come to take her. Mm -hmm. You know, overseas that she's mm -hmm. going to learn how to do braids yeah. there and make money and send mm -hmm. money down. Do you think because these things are still happening even now? Do you think that there is no, um, you know, enough information for mm. people who still send their children or for youths who still want to tour their parts? Mm. Um, I want to start by saying that um, the economy of Edo State, particularly, is hinged largely on remittances, True. Uh, money coming from abroad. And um, if you drive around the city, most of the small businesses that you see were um, started from remittances, you know, from relatives, brothers, sisters who live abroad, you know. And um, if you look at the history of how human trafficking started in Edo State, Edo State, unfortunately, to date, um, ranks highest in, in Nigeria. For the in Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah, trafficking in young girls and women, basically for um, sexual exploitation. And um, it has become more like a cultural thing, you know, and that's why it's difficult to curtail, you know, um, because um, we see the motivations, we see houses built by young girls who were trafficked, 
you know, cars, buildings, businesses, you know. Um, if you go to the market shops, or may, most of the markets around um, those states, you know, the shops are owned by women, some of them whose daughters are abroad, mm. you know. And um, it has become more like a cultural a thing. Norm. Exactly, you know, because um, the, the, the mother sees their neighbor that have, I mean... Has um, made it to an extent. Exactly, you know, as a result, you know. And so they encourage their daughters to take um, the same step, you know. And um, it's actually like a cycle because the first generation of um, women who were trafficked, you know, who were victims, ended up becoming madams. <laughs> you know, because, exactly, because you, 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 you were trafficked, you pay off the debt. And now you want to have your own chain of exactly. girls. Exactly. You start doing the same thing. So it became like a vicious circle, you know, <laughs> where they also come back, recruit girls, and the girls, as soon as they pay off the debt, they also become their own madams, wow. you know. And that's how it, it started, wow. you know. So it is so, a cultural problem. Yeah, okay. we can say it's a cultural problem because it has become more like a part of the people. Yeah. So you know. I was wondering, um, I, I came across this docu-series on one of those streaming platforms. It's about women that had been trafficked to European countries and then they were forced into prostitution and some of them wanted out. So if I was a young woman watching this and I had been trafficked in one of either a European country or any other Western country, how can I reach out to my government to repatriate me? What are the steps that I can take as our final question for today? Mm. Um, well, um, it's important to first state that um, currently the government of Edo states have taken some bold steps, you know, to address the issue. Um, there's a political will on the part of the government, the current government, you know. Um, um, also, the traditional institution, you know, has played a major role in um, addressing this issue. Recently, we saw um, the pronouncement by the Oba of Benin condemning the practice, summoning all the juju priests, you know. So this has, in a way, revolutionized the trafficking scope in Edo State. Mm -hmm. And um, for a young girl who is abroad and wants to come back, you know, um, you can go to the embassies, the Nigerian embassies, you can, if it is in Europe, uh, most of the European countries have caritases, you know, caritas organizations, Catholic organizations, mm -hmm. or some other NGOs providing return services, you know. But the problem, again, is that most of the girls are not willing to come back home, <laughs> you know. They want to be free. They want to be free from their traffickers, mm -hmm. but they don't want to come back home. You want to gain freedom over there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a topic for another day. That's a topic for another day. Thank you so much, <laughs> Mr. Roland. I learned so much from this conversation. I wish we could continue, but our time is far spent. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Breakfast Show. We spoke about illegal migration and the loss of Nigeria's human capital. What is the problem and how do we solve it? What do you think about the culture of Nigerians going abroad by any means necessary in the hopes that the end is going to justify the means and so many people do not even make it to the European countries alive. What do you think about the problem of illegal migration in Nigeria? Leave a comment down below. Would love to see it. My name is Joyce Chooks. It's been a fantastic time. Do not forget to like and follow us on all of our socials at TSN Nigeria TV and hit subscribe down below TSN Nigeria TV. Join our online family. Have yourself a splendid day. Goodbye. Stay connected to TSL Nigeria and get updates on the go all day, every day. Subscribe to our YouTube channel on TSL Nigeria Space TV and join our online family.